one. Um, his background is immunology, but he uh, was, was um, smartly recruited to Washington University in St. Louis, um, which has a fabulous itch center. So he now thinks neuro a lot. Um, and the other thing is, he, he got married about five weeks ago, and uh, it's wonderful that he's here and not still on a honeymoon. Brian. Thank you, Ethan, for the introduction. Thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'll, I'll start by just talking about recent work we've done, and what I'll focus a little bit more on today is putting this work into the context of the work of others, uh, a lot of clinical findings, and also speak to emerging clinical trials and how this work actually specifically plugs into what we're now seeing in the uh, uh, clinical trial space uh, with regard to atopic dermatitis and itch. Uh, I have a number of disclosures. Uh, personally, I think they're all relevant because they're all subsequent to the work that I'm going to be showing here today. I also have a, uh, a patent application for the use of JAK inhibitors actually for itch, which will also be discussed in this talk. So uh, Serena spoke about atopic dermatitis, and she explained this quite well. Uh, this is a disease in which we've been really exploring this as a, uh, a model paradigm in which to uh, study both inflammation and itch. And we've always been interested in understanding how inflammation leads to rash in the skin. And more recently, we focused our attention on understanding how inflammation leads to the sensation of itch, which uh, uh, Serena was uh, referring to quite a bit. Importantly in this disorder, itch is the central and uh, hallmark symptom. So when we actually first embarked on these studies, when we were trying to understand how inflammation leads to the rash, we were focused, uh, the paradigm was that T cells were really at the uh, center of this uh, universe. And then the idea was that the Th2 cell, uh, marked by the production of the Th2 cell associated cytokines, IL 4, 5, and 13, results in uh, uh, damage to the epithelial barrier, but also the underlying immune dysfunction we know of in atopic dermatitis, uh, as an example, elevation of IgE. But with the discovery of the epithelial cell drive cytokines, uh, particularly IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP, it was known that these uh, cytokines are actually uh, leaked from uh, damaged epithelia and can broadly activate this pathway. Uh, when we started to look more deeply at this, what we had found was that, in fact, uh, not only T cells, but other innate cell populations, such as basophils in circulation, get recruited in in response to these cytokines. And also, uh, previously unrecognized innate lymphoid cells, uh, ILC2s, group 2 innate lymphoid cells, uh, are actually dominant sources of these type 2 cytokines. So um, in, in the in interest of time, I won't show any of this data as it's been actually published for a while now. But uh, w these are all papers showing uh, the uh, identification of these, particularly these ILC2s, and their contributions to uh, atopic dermatitis. But uh, what this work actually allowed us to do was really lay the foundation for uh, understanding um, how not only inflammation arises, but also itch. And as we know, blocking these effector cytokines like IL-4 and IL-13, uh, especially with the advent of dupilumab, has, become, has proven to be highly efficacious in the setting of atopic dermatitis. But also during these st the clinical trials and subsequent to the uh, uh, delivery of this drug into the market, uh, people have come to appreciate that itch is something that improves quite dramatically. And this was something that uh, uh, we were very interested in. So we actually took a step back and uh, thought about how itch could actually be impacted in disease more specific specifically. So how does inflammation in this setting actually lead to itch? Uh, we know that histamine uh, can bind a histamine receptor on peripheral sensory neurons and activate these neurons to fire, and this actually can evoke uh, symptoms of itch. Uh, we also know that non-histaminergic pathways, such as the MRGPRA3 uh, receptor, uh, which uh, my colleague in the itch center, Chin Liu, characterized, uh, is responsive to the compound chloroquine. Its endogenous ligands are being identified. Uh, but is a very important uh, itch sensory receptor as well in, in the periphery. Further, if we go into the cytokine space, we know that cytokines such as IL-31 uh, as well as uh, TSLP can actually also bind uh, the sensory nervous system and modulate 
uh, the itch sensation. And we, we know, now know that IL-31 uh, antagonism, antagonism is actually emerging as a potential therapeutic uh, uh, strategy for atopic itch as well. So uh, t taking a note from uh, uh, these studies and really putting this all together, we were very interested in understanding how uh, with the discovery of these innate cell populations and their contributions to atopic dermatitis, whether simply these effector type 2 cytokines could directly somehow modulate itch. So to test this, we actually uh, looked directly on sensory neurons. We extracted dorsal root ganglia from both mice and humans. And what we found was a very striking pattern, which is that IL-4 receptor alpha is certainly expressed. Um, but uh, we routinely could not detect IL-5 receptor, or, and we could also, act, in fact, detect the native IL-13 receptor. As you would expect, based on what I've told you, we could certainly reliably detect uh, the IL-31 receptor as well. And we could find this both, that this was a very much conserved between both mice and humans. And, and provoking the notion that perhaps these sensory neurons could actually directly respond to cytokine, particularly to type 2 cytokines. And indeed, if we actually perform calcium imaging, uh, we can actually uh, extract DRG uh, and uh, place these into the Petri dish um, and actually measure calcium responses, uh, shown as spikes here, in response to IL-4 over time. Um, as well, we, and we, as with our expression data, we see that this is a highly conserved between both mouse and human as well. So then we actually took this in vivo. So we actually wanted to uh, see how does neuronal signaling of IL-4 actually affect itch. To do this, we actually used a well-established mouse model, which we have employed many times over, uh, in which mice are treated with cal topical calcipatrial, or MC903, which is an irritant and uh, quite readily uh, induces AD-like disease. Um, notably, this is actually used to treat psoriasis, and we think perhaps this is one mechanism by which MC903 works. It antagonizes the TH17 pathway, but certainly promotes the TH2 pathway. When we go into this mouse model and we actually transcriptionally profile the skin, we find that it mirrors what we know about human atopic dermatitis. We see upregulation of the epithelial cell derived cytok cytokines, the type 2 cytokines. Uh, we see downregulation of filaggrin. Well, we see uh, it, re it really does transcriptionally mirror what we see. But the point here being is that there are potentially a number of pyridogens or itch inducing factors that are highly upregulated in the setting. And this is indeed associated with the development of itch in vivo, as you can see on the right. And um, uh, someone was asking about, is there any kind of uh, rewiring of the nervous system, perhaps, uh, in the setting of chronic inflammation? So if we actually now induce AD-like disease in the mice and we extract out the DRG, we now actually see upregulation of these receptors, a variety of uh, potential itch-regulating receptors, indicating that perhaps there's actually a durable, actually, rewiring of the nervous system as well. One can imagine if this remains permanent, this would actually be potentially very problematic. Furthermore, uh, if we actually intravitally, so while the mouse is alive, image these uh, IL-4 expressing cells, uh, what we actually were able to do is generate mice in which the nor peripheral neurons fluoresce red, the IL-4 expressing cells actually fluoresce green, and we can now look if in the control ear and we find very little in the way of IL-4 expressing cells, but when we induce inflammation uh, in the treated uh, ear skin, what we find is an influx of green IL-4 expressing cells, and these cells, in fact, interact with the sensory nerves. And what we found is that this was not simply a stochastic random uh, uh, movement of these cells intravitally, but rather when we characterize this, we find that these cells actually, once they move in rather quickly, as you can see on the left, and once they interact with the nerve, if we track these cells, they seem to actually stick to the nerve. And once they release from the nerve, they move away quite rapidly, indicating that these uh, interactions may actually be uh, rather specific. And if you look on the right, what we find is that the nerve-associated cells actually move at a lower uh, speed, mean speed than the non-nerve-associated cells in this environment. So currently we're characterizing what are the molecular factors actually that regulate this kind of process. But the, the really million-dollar question for us is if we actually delete the receptor on the, the nerve, can we impact the disease in vivo? So we actually generated mice in which IL-4 receptor alpha is deleted specifically in the peripheral sensory nerves. We subjected these mice to AD-like disease, and in fact, what we found was that itch was quite dramatically reduced, as shown on the left. 
And in, in association with this, we saw a reduction in the disease severity measured by both the earth thickness as well as uh, uh, histologic parameters. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't, uh, uh, I won't talk about this. Also, uh, uh, much of this data is now published. And uh, essentially what we found was that IL-4 is not really a pyridogen. It doesn't really induce itch, but what it does is it really modifies uh, the sensory nervous system response to all these other pyridogens that are upregulated in the highly inflamed skin. And uh, we think that this may actually inform therapy. This may actually make us think differently about how IL-4 receptor alpha antagonism works. Sure, it's anti-inflammatory, but actually it may be uh, neuromodulatory as well. At the time we were doing these studies, though, we, uh, dupilumab was not out. This was not really a therapeutic option. Uh, and we were actually thinking, okay, how else can we approach this? Well, we know that IL-4 receptor has to signal through the JAK signaling pathway. So we actually looked, show, showing on the right, uh, on previously published uh, single-cell RNA-seq data sets, and what we in fact found was that uh, proreceptive neurons at the single-cell level actually seemed to very much express JAK1. Uh, we could not detect JAK2, the other JAKs. That's not to say they're not expressed, because the sequencing depth at the single-cell level is often limited, but we could certainly readily detect JAK1. So, as you would expect, uh, we actually deleted JAK1, specifically in the sensory neurons, subject these, these mice to AD-like disease. In this experiment, we actually took a very different approach. We actually looked much earlier before we knew that there would be a big divergence in disease. And what we, in fact, found was there was a reduction in the itch, as shown on the left, even when there was no reduction in the inflammation. Uh, what I'd like to point out here is that the kind of central dogma in the treatment of atopic dermatitis is that you have to treat the inflammation to get rid of the itch. But what we're showing here is that at the molecular level, with just deleting one, one gene, we can actually reduce the itch even in face of inflammation. So what I'd like to propose, and what I'd like to say even a little bit more provocatively, is that we know that the JAK inhibitors are anti-inflammatory, but what we're finding in our hands is that we think that the JAK inhibitors are actually much more neuromodulatory in the sending of itch. Um, so uh, we actually wanted to really test this, and to test this, we actually went into another disease. Uh, this is actually what I see mostly in my clinic. We have a specialty itch clinic. Uh, we see chronic idiopathic pruritus. These patients present with uh, uh, really no specific cause for their itch. They don't have rash. They have no universally effective treatments. They're highly refractory to anti-inflammatory therapies, and they have severe chronic itch, at least in our clinic, on average, higher than those with moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, as shown on the right. This is what these patients look like. This is the patient on the right, in contrast to the patient on the left with lesional atopic dermatitis skin. And in fact, if we actually treat these patients with JAK inhibitors or JAK inhibs, specifically tofacitinib here, what we find is that these patients respond quite uh, robustly. Uh, you, we find the, uh, on the left is the uh, numerical rating scale itch score pretreatment, showing that these patients are quite severe. And then on the right, you see uh, their response. And in fact, even if patients are treated with cyclosporin, um, just out of sheer desperation to get rid of whatever inflammation there is, uh, we find that even if they don't respond, if we switch them over to the JAK inhibitor, that the, uh, the response is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, we've actually subsequently treated a number of more patients with this, and we're continuing to see this kind of result. So what we're doing now is that we're, we're actually exploring new ways to actually employ these JAK inhibs. Um, what we can now do is actually induce uh, as a model, we use AD-like disease as a model of itch, and when we do this, we can actually leave the mice to develop their disease um, uh, with uh, no treatment with the JAK inhibitor whatsoever. Then one day, or to uh, 12 to 24 hours prior to measuring their itch, we can deliver a low dose of, in, as an example here, ruxolidinib, uh, a JAK inhibitor, intrathecally, and then the, uh, one day later, later measure their itch. And so you would expect there's no effect on peripheral skin inflammation as this drug is delivered intrathecally. But when we actually do take this approach, we actually see a, a marked reduction in itch, even with just one delivery intrathecally a day before. Furthermore, this is a yet another approach we've been taking. Uh, we actually subject these mice to AD-like disease, and 24 hours before we measure itch, uh, when these mice have never seen a JAK inhibitor, we actually gave the JAK1 selective inhibitor, itacinib, uh, intranasally to deliver this into the uh, 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 nervous system. 
And in fact, when we do this, we also see a, a very dramatic uh, reduction in itch as well. So, uh, what does this all mean? W what's the implication of this? Well, um, as an example, AbbVie has a JAK inhibitor that's uh, currently in development. And what, when, when you actually see what's coming off with uh, these trials, we're starting to see what we see actually in mice as well. Uh, we, here we have a JAK inhibitor up at acidinib, uh, which demonstrated a reduction in pruritus or itch within the first week, uh, while there was improvement in skin, in skin inflammation at, at two weeks. And this is a common theme. We're seeing that uh, these JAK inhibitors have a, a itch effect prior to even any uh, effect on the inflammation. We also see that with uh, topical uh, JAK inhibitors, the effect on itch is uh, happening as early as 24 hours. And this has been shown a couple of times already. Uh, to really highlight this point, if you actually look on the uh, purple dotted line, if you compare the topical JAK inhibitor to tacrolimus, uh, which is the anti-inflammatory agent, we see that it takes out up to about a week to really see a difference in terms of uh, the change in itch severity. While at appropriate doses of the topical JAK inhibitor, shown in the uh, blue, uh, yellow, and red lines, we see a reduction in itch as early as uh, one day after treatment. So this was actually, uh, it, this actually could have been somewhat predicted. Uh, this is a, a, a work by uh, Yasuda et al. And actually, uh, I think Kenji Kawashima is in the front row as I was a part of this work. Uh, they actually had mice that actually had gain of function mutations in JAK1. And these mice to develop pruritic derm dermatitis. And interestingly, even if when they transferred in uh, bone marrow uh, that was actually normal or wild type into these mice, they, they could actually not rescue this phenotype. In, in, and conversely, when they actually transferred in JAK1 gain of function mutation bone marrow into wild type mice, they could not recapitulate this pruritic dermatitis already indicating that there's maybe some stromal component driving this process. Uh, we suspect that perhaps there's a neural JAK1 activation that's driving this. How about patients? Well, the first JAK1 gain of function germline gain of function mutation patients were just discovered. These patients also have severe pruritic dermatitis. Um, subsequent to our work, actually, the, uh, the PI contacted me and said that these children actually have very severe itch, uh, and they do not, they cannot sleep, and they do not respond to prednisone. It was only with the discovery of the JAK1 gain of function mutation that they received ruxolidinib and were able to actually start sleeping. So, what, so essentially, it seems that this, these phenomena that we're actually observing in mice are uh, quite predictive of what may actually be happening in, in, in patients, both with therapies as well as genetic diseases. Uh, what I'd like to highlight is by understanding the pathogenesis of disease through uh, understanding these epithelial cell cytokines, these novel innate cell populations, their effector cytokines, and identifying uh, novel functions on neurons, we've actually been able to really inform um, what's really going on in the clinical space. Furthermore, I'd like to suggest that in conditions like chronic idiopathic pruritus, even in the absence of robust inflammation, this itch may still commence. Uh, I may I want to be a little bit more provocative and even say that perhaps there may be uh, inflammation autonomous events occurring in the nervous system where the nervous system is simply turned on and it's really hard to shut down. And we really have to take neuromodulatory approaches to actually treat itch in this setting. So I'd like to just end by saying that, you know, we really started with one disease that was atopic dermatitis back in about 2009, 2008. Uh, and, you know, we've really been able to uh, broaden our understanding not only of this disease, but genetic diseases. This has really afforded uh, our, an opportunity to identify new both uh, uh, molecular targets as well as the identification of new cell populations both in the immune system as well as the nervous system. And furthermore, as many of you are aware, there are a number of therapeutics targeting these pathways that are emerging and this has implications not just for atopic dermatitis, I'd like to underscore, but a number of diseases both in dermatology as well as beyond that affect a lot of our neighboring specialties. Lastly, I'd like to thank members of my lab. Uh, Landon Etchen really uh, pioneered a lot of this work. He just left my laboratory this week, actually, to go back to the clinic. Um, but I really have a talented team. We really actually have a, a talented group, uh, our ex extensive group of collaborators, our funding sources. And lastly, I'd like to say we are looking for more talented people in our lab. So if you're interested in a postdoctoral fellowship, please contact me. Thank you. Brian, that, that was uh, fabulous, and it, it is amazing how Jack's 
or blocking jacks is showing up all over in dermatology. Um, we're not going to have time for questions at this moment because we're a bit behind. I apologize for that. Uh, but the, the next speaker is Junichi Hachisuke. Um, and he's going to talk about how the spinal cord interprets and modulates itch. And uh, I particularly want to welcome him, um, not simply because of the, the work that he is doing. He is, he's been working with Sarah Ross in neuroscience at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, but this is also his first SID meeting, IID meeting. And so Junichi, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to thank Ethan and the uh, organizer for uh, inviting me as a speaker. And, uh, so today I'm going to talk about the itch mechanism in the spinal cord. So this is a picture of the atopic dermatitis patient. And you see uh, redness and scratch marks on the back. But what's important is that uh, so there is no skin, uh, no, no eruption where it's difficult to scratch. So uh, it's very important to uh, control itch sensation. And if you are succeeded with uh, controlling the itch and the scratching, probably it's much easier to treat uh, atopic der dermatitis. But how do we treat itch? But I think there are limited options uh, to to uh, treat itch. We use moisturizers uh, to repair barrier function, and uh, we use a corticosteroid to suppress inflammation. And nowadays, we have uh, biologic, biologics, and I think they have a uh, big uh, potential. But when you look at the pain management, uh, we have uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. But other drugs, uh, including opioids or antidepressant or anticonvulsant, they are acting on the, the pain neuron directory. So we have a lot of options to treat uh, pain, uh, uh, pain patient. And I think there is only one itch drug that directly uh, affects nervous system, uh, which is uh, nafurafine. Uh, this is a kappa opioid receptor agonist, sorry, this should be the agonist. And uh, yeah, but unfortunately, this is uh, only available in Japan and only approved for the uremic itch. So the, why, why do we have only a limited number of the itch treatment? I think it's because we don't really understand the mechanism of itch. So here's the, uh, so how do we discrim discriminate itch and pain? And uh, there are several hypothes hypotheses. So one classic one is uh, intensity theory. In this theory, uh, the same pathway uh, sends uh, pain and itch. So if the neuron fires a lot, we feel pain. And if neurons fire less, uh, we feel itch. And, uh, but the problem is that in this theory, we can't explain why we have a severe itch. So this is other uh, theory. This is called a specific theory. So in this theory, uh, itch and pain are uh, transmitted by other uh, populations. But the problem is that most of the itch neurons are uh, responsive to mechanical stimulation, such as uh, uh, responsive to pain stimulation, such as mechanical or capsaicin. So the alternative uh, theory is the selective theory. So in this theory, so there are uh, itch and pain-sensitive uh, neurons, and also uh, pain-sensitive uh, neurons. So when we got uh, itch stimulation to the skin, uh, only green neurons uh, are activated, and we feel itch. And when we got a painful stimulation, uh, it activates both uh, red and green populations, but also it activates inhibitory interneurons. So inter inhibitory interneuron means uh, when it activated, uh, it released uh, GABA or glycine. Uh, it's, uh, they are the inhibitory neurotransmitter and uh, inhibit the activity of the postsynaptic cell. So when we got a pain, uh, pain stimulation, uh, only red cells are activated, so, we, so that's why we, we feel pain. 
And I like this uh, idea because using this idea, uh, it's very easy to uh, explain why uh, counter stimulus such as scratching uh, attenuate itch. In fact, uh, our lab has found a very interesting uh, inhibitory interneuron uh, population in the spinal cord. So uh, we have the BHLHB5 uh, knockout mass. Well, BHLHB5 is very difficult to pronunciate, so I just call it B5. So uh, when you look at the B5 knockout mass, uh, they show an uh, elevated uh, response to uh, each stimulation. And when we look at the spinal cord, uh, we see uh, in, uh, in BH B5 uh, knockout mass, uh, the s a certain inhibitory interneurons are missing in the superficial dorsal horn. So we think that these uh, inhibitory interneuron population is very important for uh, inhibiting the, uh, the each pathway. And what's more interesting is that uh, these uh, B5I neurons are, exp uh, are expressing the dynorphin, which is an endogenous capital operator receptor uh, agonist. Why, why is it interesting? Because we know that mu opioids and capital opioids have the opposite effect. So mu opioids cause euphoria in the central nervous system, whereas uh, capital opioids cause dysphoria. And mu opioids uh, inhibits pain. That's why we use as a painkiller, uh, whereas capital opioids inhibit itch. But we don't really know the site of action. But because, of, because we, know, we now know that the dynorphin is expressed in the B5I neuron, so this, uh, we think that cap op opioid inhibit itch in the spinal cord. So to test that, uh, we looked at the, the chloroquine-induced scratch behavior. So when we, uh, so a cap opioid agonist is uh, interstitial, interstitial injection of capital opioid uh, significantly decrease the scratching behavior. So this indicate that um, uh, the activation of capital opioid receptor in the spinal cord is sufficient for uh, each inhibition. Next, we uh, apply the kappa antagonist, and it significantly increases the itch response. So this means that mod uh, modulating opioid tone in the spinal cord can bidirectionally alter each sensation. Then the next question is, what is the neural uh, circuit basis? To look at the neural circuit, I think the elective physiology is the best way. And uh, when you do the patch current recording from the spinal cord, we always make a spinal cord slices. But I, I don't really like this approach. The biggest disadvantage is that there's no input from the skin. As you can see in the slide, we make, a, we make a spinal cord slice, but there's no input from the skin. So we don't know whether the recorded neurons are responsive to pain or temperature or touch or itch. And the next, uh, the other uh, disadvantage is that uh, as we make a slice, we cut a lot, lot of uh, dendrite and axons. So we damage, a, damage the spinal cord circuit a lot. So uh, to overcome this uh, disadvantage, we decide to make a new preparation, which is called the semi-intact somatosensory preparation. So the idea is that uh, we take the whole spinal cord with nerve and the skin. So the so advantage of this preparation is that we can apply natural stimulation to the skin. So uh, we can apply mechanical stimulation, temperature stimulation, or itch stimulation, whatever. And uh, we can record the response to those uh, natural stimulation. And as we take the whole spinal cord, the, every circuit is preserved. So uh, using optogenetics, uh, we can modulate the activity of the anterior neurons and look at the microcircuit in the spinal cord. And third, 
Uh, in the spinal cord, vast majority of the cells are interneuron. That means they, uh, make, a, they make a local circuit, but they do not uh, project uh, the information to the brain. So the only projection neuron uh, send the information to the brain, but the number is limited. So if you randomly pass to the dorsal horn neuron, you can't record the, the activity of the, the projection neuron. And using pro this, uh, this uh, preparation, uh, we can look at the, we can identify the, the projection neuron and make a patch count recording. So this is a picture of our uh, preparation. As you can see here, you see a, a whole spinal goal that is uh, connected to uh, the, the dorsal root and saphenous nerve and the skin. So we can make a whole cell patch count recording from the spinal cord, and at the same time, I can stimulate the skin. And this is a side view of the preparation. And uh, the whole spinal cord is pinned down to the cerebral chamber, and uh, there is a microscope above the spinal cord. So you can, I you can identify the cell. And as you can see here, uh, the label, we can clearly see the labeled cell, so we can patch onto the projection neuron. So first, I wanted to know whether the, the, there is a each pathway in the spinal cord. I want to know whether the projection neurons are activated by uh, each stimulation. Uh, to test that, I recorded from the projection neuron in the spinal cord, lambda 1. And here, I applied a cowhead spicule. So cowhead is a tropical plant, and uh, there are a lot of hairs or spicules on the pot seed, and when you test that, it's very itchy. And so I applied a cowhead spicule, and I saw a nice response uh, to the, the cowhead spicule. I also tested other uh, pruritogen, which is uh, serotonin, uh, this is also a famous uh, pruritogen for rodents, and you see the nice response. And interesting thing is that uh, when I scratch the skin, uh, you see the absence of, uh, absence of firing for several seconds. So this means that the scratching activates some uh, inhibitory interneurons, and this inhibitory interneuron may uh, uh, suppress the activity of each pathway, somewhere in the pa each pathway. So as I mentioned earlier, we think that dynorphin expressing cell must be uh, the candidate uh, for the, the, uh, that may play a great role for the uh, each inhibition. So we think that dynorphin Cree cell uh, dynorphin expressing cell might be um, activated by the stimuli, uh, the scratching or the counter stimuli. So to do that, we use the dynorphin Cree animal, which is crossed with the the TD tomato. So uh, we can we can record from the dynorphin expressing cell using this animal, and uh, look at the response to the scratching or noxious heat or noxious cold. And this is the result. And as you can see here, uh, the dynorphin Cree cells are activated by scratching or noxious heat or noxious cold. So this suggests that uh, the dynorphin Cree cells are activated by the counter stimulus such as scratching. Next, I wanted to know whether the projection neurons are uh, 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 inhibit, well, re receive the direct inhibition by the dynorphin, uh, dynorphin expressing cell. To test that, uh, we decide to use the optogenetics. So optogenetics is a technique to control the activity of the selective uh, neurons. So we use channel rhodopsin. So channel rhodopsin is a photosensitive uh, uh, cation channel. So uh, when you shine blue light, it opens the channel and uh, the sodium, uh, sodium ion comes in and depolarizes and causes action potential. So let's say these circles are spinal cord neurons. And there are many kinds of, uh, many populations in the spinal cord. So uh, we are interested in dynorphin expressing cell. So we use the, we use the dynorphin Cree, uh, Cree animal. So this Cree animal is uh, crossed with the channel reporter. 
And uh, so uh, when we shine blue light to the spinal cord, only dynofin and Cree cell are uh, activated, and you, see, you can see the action potential. So I made a patch kind of recording from the projection neuron, and if this, uh, if this uh, projection neuron received input from the dynofin Cree cell, uh, we would expect to see the inhibitory current from the dynofin Cree cell. And as you can see here, the, the photo activation of the dynofin Cree cell uh, induced uh, the nice uh, IPSC response, which is an uh, inhibitory response. So um, this shows that the projection neuron received direct uh, inhibition by the, the dynofin Cree cell. So how about uh, interneurons? As I said, there are a lot of uh, interneurons in the spinal cord. And we know that some of them are mediating uh, each sensation, uh, which is a GRPR expressing cell. So uh, we wanted to test whether GRPR expressing interneuron received input from the dynofin Cree cell. So to test that, I recorded from the projection neuron, and I applied GRP, which is uh, uh, which which activated the GRP receptor and activate the GRPR expressing interneuron. So here's the result. So when I applied GRP, it increased the uh, EPSC activity, and this e EPSC activity was uh, significantly blocked by the blue light, uh, uh, blue light stimulation. So this indicates that uh, dynofin Cree cell inhibit the activity of the GRPR expressing uh, interneuron in the spinal cord. And uh, I'm interested in the, the mu opioid and the kappa opioid. And uh, mu opioid has, a, as I said, a mu opioid inhibit pain, but it increase itch. So I th Think about the, the I think about the mechanism of the uh, increase of each by the, the mu opioid receptor, uh, mu opioids. And basically, mu, opio uh, mu opioid receptor is an inhibitory receptor. So uh, I think it's reasonable to think that the dynofin expressing cell express uh, mu opioid receptor as if you apply the morphine to the spinal cord, probably it will uh, decrease the activity of the dynofin Cree cell and probably will feel more itch. So to test that, uh, we recorded from the dynofin expressing cell, which is labeled with TD tomato, and we applied the uh, Damgo, which is a mu opioid receptor agonist. And uh, we saw a nice uh, outward current by the, the application of Damago. So outward current means uh, opening of the potassium channel and uh, hypo hyperpolarize the, the cell. So basically, this is an inhibitory effect. So we, now we know that uh, the application of the mu opioid receptor agonist cause uh, inhibition of the dynofin uh, expressing cell. So this is a, the summary slide. So we now know that the, there is a each pathway in the spinal cord, and some uh, projection neurons are activated by uh, each stimulation, and scratching activate uh, inhibitory interneuron which express dynofin, uh, dynofin. and this dynofin uh, expressing uh, inhibitory interneuron may uh, inhibit the activity of the uh, each pathway. And this, in, uh, this dynofin expressing cell express a mu opioid receptor. So, I, so I'd like to thank the Ross Lab member and Carver Lab member, especially Sarah Ross and Rick Carver, they are fantastic uh, mentor. And uh, Yu Omori, who, is, who has a magic hand, and he helped, uh, he helped me as uh, he did uh, the many electrophysiology. So thank you very much. It, it, it's really important to understand and appreciate the power of this model that 
that Junichi has generated this, uh, this skin to spinal cord uh, model. It, there are so many things that one can do with it. Um, and, and hopefully he's willing to teach it to other, uh, other, other folks to, to take advantage of that. So again, we're not going to have time to, to do more do questions at this moment. Um, and, and we'll move on to the, to the next talk, which is, which is um, me. <laughs> um, and uh, so um, the, the, the plan was to have uh, Martin Steinhoff uh, talk about the connection between uh, nerves and mast cells. And um, sort of near the last minute, he couldn't make it from where he's now working in, in Qatar. Um, so, so I'm filling in. Um, I'm interested in, in ITCH, the ITCH Society, which was started by Gil Yosipovich, um, uh, has recently launched a, a journal, and we are now accepting uh, manuscripts. I, I'd be delighted for if people um, um, will submit more and more articles there. Um, and, and I think it's just important, as I indicated at the, in, the, in the introduction, um, you know, it's, um, we're going to be seeing more and more neuro things, not just immune. And as we all know, as a dermatologist, um, it's just it's an amazingly big clinical problem. Um, although perhaps um, Brian Kim ha will have solved it with the, uh, the JAK inhibitor approach. Okay, so connectivity between the immune and nervous system with a focus on mast cells. Um, I've already mentioned that uh, Rick Granstein introduced me to this connection with the Langerhans cells and nerves. A uh, number of disclosures, but not really directly relevant to this uh, talk. Um, so this is a picture that um, um, Andrei Slominski uh, sent me the other day uh, from a recent re recent review of his, uh, along with uh, Ralph Poss. And, and the point of this is to demonstrate kind of the complexity, uh, but in a, in a fairly simple way, of, of how the outside world is interacting with the inside world and, and then the inside, uh, uh, inside our skin uh, communicating with other, other aspects of the body, and, and, and including the brain. And, and I'm really grateful to Andre and, and to um, Ralph because they've been so keen on drawing these connections between the skin and the uh, neuroendocrine systems and, and of course immunology also. And one of the nice things about this particular figure is it, it very much prominently includes the nerves, uh, which, which are often you know, missing or don't have much of a role in the, uh, the skin figures that one traditionally sees. Um, and, and light can impact the skin in many ways, including making it itch. So, um, but getting a, uh, going from that that that, that, that uh, you know, thirty thousand foot view, and we'll get more and more granular. Um, here is a, a much simplified version um, where the uh, nerves play a prominent role, and the mast cells uh, do also. Um, and then, as we look. You know, that much more granular, uh, granular from the neuroimmune standpoint. Um, we have the sensory nerves and we have mast cells. And again, in this very simple view, they are communicating with each other, and of course they're communicating with other uh, ty uh, cell types in the skin. Um, they, they have receptors and channels on them, as, as all the cells in the body uh, do. Um, and they are connected by ligands or mediators and this, of course, results in crosstalk and feed-forward loops, um, and we've seen any number of very complex slides. So, mast cells, where do they come from? It, it, it's still, while well, we know they come from the bone marrow, it, it, exactly how they develop and what pathways are still not completely clear uh, in terms of the myeloid versus uh, erythroid, et cetera, et cetera, which is kind of surprising despite the huge amount of work that has gone into it. But in this um, um, lovely manuscript from um, uh, Frank Austin's group a couple of years ago now, they did expression profiling on mast cells. This is really a mast cell paper um, to determine 
um, you know, how unique are these cells? Uh, and of course, we know there are different mast cell populations too. But the point of this, uh, to me, is that the mast cells, by this measure, are more different. Um, you know, they, they are more separate from any other immune cell. I kind of expected maybe they would be quite similar to the basophils and the eosinophils, but at least on the transcriptional level, um, at, at rest, if you will, uh, they, they really are quite distinguished. Um, and there's another feature that distinguishes them, and that's the expression of this receptors called MRGPRs, or mass-related G-protein coupled receptors. And they were mentioned a little bit earlier in this talk, and certainly the specialists in this room are familiar with them. But, but still most people in uh, the, 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 the derm and immunology communities um, who I've run across are not particularly familiar with them yet. And, and so that is one of the f uh, areas on which I do want to focus a bit. Um, so uh, certain mass, uh, certain MRGs are expressed on mouse um, and human mast cells and, and not others. Um, and then if one looks at expression for profiling of itch neurons, and uh, Brian um, showed sort of a similar picture from the, the same author, and, and I love how the fact that um, there are various folks who do things in the skin and they have you know, skin-related portions of their, of their names. This one is uh, Usa skin, and of course we have Yosipovich. Um, but in expression following of neurons, um, a, a number of things are prominent. But, but, but in particular, uh, these MRGPRs. And several of them, again, are expressed on these uh, sensory neurons. And not all neurons. It's, it's really sensory neurons. It's its neurons. Um, and so what do they do? Um, were they relevant? And they were first identified in 2001 by two different groups. Uh, one was Xinjiang Dong at Hopkins, who has continued to do just amazing work in the area. Um, and also uh, 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 Lembo and Ahmed at um, uh, AstraZeneca. Um, so this was done both in the academic world and in, and in pharma uh, a number of years ago. And they constitute a large family of what are considered orphan uh, G protein coupled receptors or 7TM receptors. Um, and what does that mean? It means that it's not clear what the endogenous ligand is. But what happens is that in contrast to most GPCRs, uh, which, which are very specific with respect to ligands, these are just the opposite. They want to be turned on. In, in, in my view, and I think many of those in the field, they are really functioning as innate sensors. They're out there on, on these sensory neurons or on the mast cells, you know, scanning the environment or scanning you know, uh, um, you know, just inside the skin or other epithelia, such as the lung or gut, uh, looking for things. And what's special about them is they are expressed predominantly on sensory neurons and mast cells. If one looks hard enough, one can find them on other cells. Um, but what their, their function in, 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 in those other situations is not yet clear. Uh, what is clear is they are primarily uh, responsible, or one of their major roles, is mediating histamine-independent itch. And so we talk these days, we say that antihistamines are not that effective in many itchy dermatoses. Um, and so it does make one wonder that maybe targeting these receptors, um, in, in addition or instead of other pathways, might be very effective in various itches and p potentially inflammatory uh, conditions. So they are activated by a variety of peritogens. Um, they are also activated by pseudoallergens. And what's a pseudoallergen? That is something that essentially activates uh, a mast cell, but in a non-IgE, uh, non-IgE um, receptor dependent fashion. But they then do degranulate the mast cells. And a particularly critical aspect of this is that, of this degranulation, is that mast cells don't uh, degranulate the same way um, given all stimuli. And uh, so there are different types of granules. Uh, they can 
fuse before being released. They can be released on mass. And what happens in the conventional allergy or immune-mediated IgE-stimulated mast cell degranulation, there's a lot of you know, these vesicles getting together, and then and that takes some time, and they are then dumped. Um, in contrast, when um, compounds that stimulate MRGs on mast cells um, activate the MRG, the vesicle release, or the vesicles, they're much simpler, and it happens very, very quickly. So there really is this concept of, of differential uh, mast cell release. So we have also found that staph delta toxin, and I'll show you a little picture, um, activates um, um, mast cell GPC, uh, GPCR, or MRG. Um, and DERP1, the dust mite allergen, uh, activates a neuro uh, uh, MRGPR. So a variety of peridins activate these MRGs. They include compound 4880, which is widely used in itch studies, uh, various uh, serine proteases, and of course, um, substance P. And, and that led us to a question that we started to address a number of years ago and answered recently. So substance P has been implicated in atopic dermatitis and psoriasis in terms of itch, and it classically activates the NK1 receptor, neurokinin 1 receptor. And neurokinin 1 receptor antagonists work extremely well in mice, but pretty uniformly they haven't worked in humans except for the treatment of nausea. Um, and, and there was even a, uh, a recent uh, study, uh, uh, you know, a clinical study uh, from a, a company that came out um, using an NK1 antagonist, and, and, and it did not reach their primary endpoints in either itch or atopic dermatitis. So why don't they work well? And that was a question that we had. Um, and so we, we looked at scratching behavior in NK1 knockout mice and compared that to wild-type mice. And as shown in, in, in the image on the, on the, on the screen, um, following injection of substance P locally into the skin, into the, the cheek or neck, um, there was no difference. So this would suggest that NK1 is not that important in scratching and do some substance P in mice and therefore potentially humans. But in contrast, when we look at mice in which a cluster of MRGPRs have been knocked out, these were mice generated in, 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 in Xinjiang Dong's lab, um, these mice basically barely scratched to substance P. Um, so we, we ran with this and were able to identify the MRG, uh, the specific MRG that, that's relevant. The nomenclature gets a bit uh, complex or painful. Um, but another interesting thing about this particular slide is that the mast cell MRGPR in the mice is still present. So substance P is actually inducing scratching behavior by directly activating neurons. Um, okay, so as another example of what's activated by uh, these MRGs, particularly the human mast cell MRG called X2, MRGPR X2. Uh, a variety of, of drugs that cause reactions acutely, um, a variety of dyes that are used in, in radiology, so-called basic secretagogues, activate this receptor. And so we decided to look at vancomycin because it causes red man syndrome. And you know, how it works was not known. And it very nicely activates um, MRGPR X2. Um, uh, this is a calcium image experiment. Uh, and, and, and we decided to publish this in itch, uh, rather than in a fancier journal, um, just to help you know, you know, get, get the, improve the metrics. Um, but we do want people to, to help us out here, too. OK, then we also asked, well, what about staph delta toxin? which is tightly implicated or linked to atopic dermatitis. And sure enough, this toxin is quite good at activating uh, this mast cell uh, MRG receptor. And the last example I want to give is, um, well, the mast cell MRG is not activated by dust mite an uh, antigen. Um, a neural 
uh, MRGPR, MRGPR A, uh, X1 is indeed activated and induces the release of interleukin-6. So in sort of a comparison of a very simple-minded comparison of mast cells and neurons, mast cells, they make, they make histamine, they make interleukin-4, they make a lot of interleukin-4, uh, nerve growth factor, variety of uh, serine proteases, serotonin, and we talked about differential granule release uh, via the conventional IgE receptor or this other pathway activated by X2 and, and uh, X2 receptor in mice and the B2 and, 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 and X2 in human and B2 in mice. And in contrast with neurons, they make a lot of substance P, and of course they make uh, CGRP as was discussed extensively yesterday, but they don't make IL-4. But they do express um, a variety of things. They express JAKs, as do all cells, and we heard from um, uh, Brian that JAK1 is particularly important. They also uh, express receptors for IL-4, uh, 13, 31, certain MRGPRs, and surprisingly, but not in retrospect, while they express the H1 receptor, the histamine 1 receptor, um, they don't express very much of it. And they really don't express very much um, NK1 receptor either. So it, it's just fascinating how the, the, these MRGs seem to do a pretty good job of linking uh, mast cells and neurons together, um, and, 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 and they are often present in close proximity. Um, so there really is a connection there. And that leads to the possibility of new approaches to targeting uh, nerves and mast cells. Um, in, in, in the community very much thinks that MRGPRs are important. They may be, um, you know, provide a drug um, to do what antihistamines have never been able to do. Uh, one should be able to consider uh, blockade of vesicle fusion and granule release, not simply in nerves, as is done with um, botulinum toxin, but also in mast cells. There is some recent work um, in which uh, Anna DiNardo uh, published uh, in, in, in the journal Toxin uh, just a short time ago uh, this year, um, where botulinum toxin um, uh, inhibits granular release from uh, human mast cells. And one can already target the IgE receptor, and I look forward to the possibility of developing antagonists to MRGPRs. And I'd like to thank members of my lab, including Esan Azimi, uh, Serena, who gave a talk, a wonderful talk earlier in this session, uh, Tuan Lo and, and VB Reddy, and a, along with other colleagues um, um, at, at a variety of institutions. And I'd like to thank our uh, funders for supporting the, the work. And I, again, I want to step back to um, um, Itch. The, the Itch Society has this new journal, and I very much look forward to uh, this community helping it grow. Thank you very much.